This video was brought to you by my loyal patrons. Pledge today and receive exclusive perks. Link in the description. Dear Christopher, Here is your friend Thomas the Tank Engine. He wanted to come out of his station yard and see the world. These stories tell you how he did it. Welcome back, folks, to the Thomas Retrospective. And boy, oh boy, are we in for a treat today. Folks, we are knees deep in the era of Thomas the Tank Engine that I hardly ever rewatch. The hit entertainment era. Watching all of Season 8 last time all in one go felt like a new experience for me. And now with Season 9? Yeesh, it's gotta be over a decade since I actually watched some of these episodes. I'm happy to say, though, that I came out of this marathon with some delightful finds. And also some, well, not so delightful finds. So let's dive on in and talk about them. Two thousand five was a rather big year for Thomas and Friends. It marked the sixtieth anniversary of the Railway Series books, and in honor of this, Hit Entertainment opted to make a direct to home media special calling all engines. This movie would mark the start of the ninth season. As the title suggests, this was a special that marketed itself on featuring all the currently established characters in the show. Except not really at all, but we'll get to that. It also featured the grand return of Lady and Diesel 10, two characters previously exclusive to Thomas and the Magic Railroad. And boy oh boy, did they want you to know that Diesel 10 was in this thing. He was plastered on every single promotional material for this special. Call in All Engines and Season 9 began their production in September 2004. In early 2005, during production, Hit Entertainment was bought out by Apex Partners and became one of their subsidiaries. Hit had previously put themselves up for sale, apparently, due to straining financials in the last half of 2004, but I don't know much about that. Following the show's soft reboot last season, Season 9 would be the second in the new Hit Entertainment era of the series. This season was the first to feature the notorious Sharon Miller, who came on as the main script editor, taking the helm from Abby Grant. Miller herself only wrote four episodes this season, but she had her hands on all the scripts. In an attempt to keep literary qualities in the show, Miller began to incorporate elements of rhyming and alliteration into the narration and character's dialogue. Shiny and bright, shiny and bright, that's what I'll be to start my day right, he chirped cheerfully. It's not really that noticeable this season, at least to me, but it does pop up every now and then. The magic lamp I know isn't true. It's just an old story and quite silly too. It will continue to become much more blatant in later seasons. Following the trend set forward in Season 8, the engine's crews continue to be phased out, and this is the first season in which an engine's driver or fireman are never alluded to. Not a single driver speaks this season, which is kind of crazy to think about. The engines only talk to each other, or other prominent human characters in stories such as Sir Topham Hatt, etc. This is also the first season where the narrator reads the episode's title aloud when the episode begins, something that would stick till the end of the show. Thomas and the Statue. Though sometimes the title isn't read aloud, depending on the release. If I recall correctly, there's a DVD or two in the US where the narrator is muted when the titles show. Winter was coming to the island of Sodor. I have... No idea why this varies. After a rather hyper-focused Season 8, Season 9 saw some major expansions to the show's cast of characters. The Narrow Gauge Engine saw their big return this year, with a heavy focus on them interacting with Thomas. For the next couple of seasons, the Narrow Gauge characters would be treated as the main B characters, as the main sect of Sodor the show would focus on apart from the main cast. As the narrow gauge engine props were all rebuilt in season 5 to a larger scale for the ease of filming, a new larger prop of Thomas was specifically built to scale with them, giving us our third Thomas prop in a new scale. 
following his main gauge 1 one and the 3.5 gauge jack scale one. With this new focus on the narrow gauge engines, there were some changes made. The biggest change saw the introduction of the Thin Controller, a character that only existed in the books, and whose role was taken up by the Fat Controller in the previous seasons. This new controller, formally named Mr. Peregrine Percival, became the controller of the Scarlowy Railway, and was the authority figure specifically for the narrow gauge engines. Another interesting change made this year was Rusty's gender. In the books, the character of Rusty was always male. However, when brought to the screen in Season 4, Britt Allcroft made the decision to keep Rusty gender neutral, only ever being referred to as the Little Diesel instead of him or her. I see you've met Rusty, said Peter Sam. Yes, I like that Diesel. The Little Diesel refused to move. This was something that was kept in the seasons following. The Little Diesel checks that the tracks, tunnels and bridges are all in good working order. The Little Diesel pulled him off the bridge just in time. With the release of Season 9, plans were made to change Rusty to female to add some gender diversity to the Narrow Gauge clan. This may have been something that they planned far in advance as it is reflected in Rusty's bio in the Writer's Bible. This change went forward specifically in the US dub, and the original airings feature Michael Brandon referring to Rusty as she. Rusty's favorite journey was by the lake. She liked to toot her horn there. This made Rusty very happy. No one had ever liked her horn before. While no reason has ever been given for this, Pitt went back on this, and decided to change Rusty back to male, as per the original source material. Michael Brandon was brought back to re-narrate the sentences where Rusty was referred to as she, to say he instead. Oh, look what you've done, Duncan, she hooted. Why did you break through the barrier? Look what you've done, Duncan, he hooted. Why did you break through the barrier? That was Rusty, peeped Peter Sam. She thinks her horn is special, but we don't. That was Rusty, peeped Peter Sam. He thinks his horn is special, but we don't. These updated versions were the ones that were put on home media, and Rusty has consistently been male in the series ever since this. This is the first retrospective where we will be covering the season and the special it's connected to in the same video. As the special came first, I think it's best to talk about it before getting into the nitty gritty of season 9. So I'll keep it simple. I'll go over the plots, the bads, and the goods, and then give you my overall thoughts. The plot of Colin All Engines revolves around tensions building between the steam engines and the diesels. A new airport is being built on Sodor, something that will bring more tourism to the island. The engines depend on this, of course, as more visitors means more work for them. Thomas, however, screws everything up one day when he decides to be cheeky to Airy, Bert, and Diesel, following them being rather rude to him. He causes delays for them, which inadvertently affects himself and the others as well. That night, a storm hits Sodor, which destroys the suspension bridge and the airport. Thomas's tricks cause the diesels to hate the steam engines, and the feelings become mutual. Tensions continue to rise during a time when the engines should be working together to mend the island. And only after having a dream, Thomas convinces everyone to work together, as getting the airport open will benefit all of them. They all come together as one, the airport opens, and everyone's happy. Yay! Also, Emily is at Tidmouth Sheds now. Alright, so let's start with the bad. I think the weirdest addition to this special is the learning segments that appear throughout it. These segments were common to the hit era and appeared between episodes on TV and on DVD. They were like little breaks between episodes, but here I think they just mess with the story's pacing. The first 10 minutes are rather jarring, cutting from movie to a bouncy song to then one more minute of movie then cut to a random, long, and boring learning segment. Then there's more movie, and suddenly an animated learning segment. It's just all over the place. These segments are just filler, 
stretching what is a snappy 40-minute special into an hour. The segments are written with preschoolers in mind, and it feels like the narrator is talking down to the audience when they pop up. What about Ari and Bert? Do they take passengers? No. Harry and Bert are good at shunting, but they don't take passengers. These segments unfortunately date the movie too, as they're not used in the show anymore. I feel similarly about the songs too, if I'm honest. Like most Thomas specials, Colin All Engines has several musical moments, with three songs that pop up throughout the runtime. Now, usually the point of adding musical moments to a movie is to use the medium to help tell the story. Usually the song will be used to tell the viewer information, like express how a character feels about something, or use that moment to show part of the world in an efficient way. It's been a hot minute since I've watched it, but I'm going to compare this to Blue Mountain Mystery, which had three musical moments in it. The first song is called Working Together, and yeah, with a name like that, it sounds pretty generic, but the song's placement in the story has a purpose. They use these few minutes to showcase the workings of Blue Mountain Quarry in a montage sequence, giving the audience a more clear idea of the movie's main setting and how everything works, what Thomas's purpose is in being here. The song shows up again later on, but for a new purpose now. Now it's being used to show Thomas and Luke warming up to each other. It's visually showing Luke is putting his trust in his new friend. Showing, not telling. The song's title takes on a new meaning. The working together is now referring specifically to Thomas and Luke's friendship. The final song appears only after the story has concluded, which sums up the story we just watched and acts as a backdrop for the end credits. Calling All Engines also has three musical breaks, all of which don't really add anything to the story. We have a song that tells us how busy the engines are, a song that reiterates the Diesels and Steamies have a rivalry, and a song that just repeats that they work together as a team. All songs with no deeper meaning, whose intents all could have just been stated in a sentence in passing for us to understand. We know the engines are busy thanks to the movie's opening montage. We know they achieve their goal at the end. I'm not arguing that the songs aren't catchy or anything. What I am arguing is that I feel they interrupt the story, and just feel like they're here to extend the runtime. I wish there was a way to watch this without the segments and the songs. I think I'd like the special much, much more if it was just a snappy half-hour special with only the movie parts. For a special called Calling All Engines, it has a rather small cast of characters. It's mostly just the main cast, the main Diesel characters, and a few very surprising comebacks. The returnees in this are all totally random. Daisy, George the Steamroller, Derek, what? And while seeing them again is certainly welcome, I have to wonder how these randos were okayed. But then the bigger secondaries like Duck, Donald, Douglas, hell, Salty, a Diesel character that probably would have been interesting in this conflict, are all strangely absent. Quite a few faces are still missing here. Colonel Engines is such a weird anomaly when you think about it. It's a movie that features the main characters and a bunch of glup shittos, none of which ever appear again in the model era. Speaking of returnees, Diesel 10 returns. This is his big comeback to the show, and the marketing really wanted you to know that he was in this. Starring Thomas the Tank Engine, Diesel 10. But then you watch the movie and just think, um, why was he in this? I get that he's supposed to be like the big final obstacle for the story's hero to overcome. He's the embodiment of Big Bad King Diesel. Getting him to help out is what makes everyone come around. I get what they were doing, but Diesel 10's character had to be twisted around for this to work. This is so not the same character that we saw previously, the one that wanted to scrap steam engines and attempted murder. I know Magic Railroad isn't canon, but still, it's a very jarring character change. I also find the reveal that Tidmus Sheds is just knocked down without any setup to be rather weird. Like, I get that they did this so that the steam engines can accuse the Diesels of destroying it, the Diesels had ruined their home. But then that's debunked, like, instantly. Building the new ones was our important job, but we were delayed so we couldn't finish it. So, why did they do it like this? Shouldn't everyone be pointing their fingers at Thomas and be mad at him for delaying them? 
If it were up to me, I would have established in the opening montage that the sheds were old and leaking or something, just so that there's some sort of reason for why they're knocked down at all. Or maybe the sheds get destroyed in the big storm or something? I don't know, find some way to work it into the story better. This plot point feels rather tacked on, because they needed a reason to make a new shed with an extra berth for Emily at the end of the movie. Those are all the major problems that I have with Colin All Engines. Shockingly, there's actually quite a lot of stuff in this that I liked. As per any Model Thomas production, there's many impressive model sequences in this. I love the big engine fight and all the creative crashes that they come up with, as ridiculous as some of them are. This whole sequence is just so out of pocket and violent, and I love it. I always got upset at the fact we never saw Gordon's crash, but then they show him with seaweed on him later on. What the hell happened to him? I'd like to think they filmed something, but maybe just cut it in editing? I wonder what it could have been. Take it to the harbor and dump it in the sea. The storm sequence is also very intense. I love the collapse of the suspension bridge. You can tell that this was something major that could only be done in one take, and they captured it brilliantly. CGI is great and all, but it'll never replicate destruction quite like this. I love that there's a whole sequence showing the engines having nightmares about their fate if the railway closed. Their nightmares are so dark and sad. And then they even made a whole song about this too? Remember how Gordon was king of the track? Look at him now or there's no going back. <laughs> it's so messed up, what the f***? I love this though. Showing the engines ultimate fears adds some needed dramatic weight to the story. It's played here for laughs, sure, but it helps us understand how the characters feel. The loss of the airport, to them, is pretty dire, and that makes us, the audience, sympathize with them. I wish they had bothered to show the Diesels having nightmares as well. I like Emily in this movie a lot. I wish she was more integral to the story so the reveal of her new birth at Tidmouth was more rewarding, but regardless, I think her personality here is rather strong. I like her being annoyed at Thomas staying with her at her shed, which, in retrospect, is pretty cool that they actually set up Emily's shed in Season 8. Great continuity. And while I wished it was worked into the story more, I do like that there is an in-universe reason for Emily joining the main cast at Tidmouth's Sheds. I've said it before, but the way they gradually worked Emily into the main cast was really respectable. They didn't just throw her in and expect you to accept her. No, they gave us a few seasons of us getting to know her first. And now we have a whole movie that explains why she's been added to the main shed. It's a status quo change that feels naturally a part of the show's world building. I really like that Lady is depicted here as a dream. It's never alluded to that she is actually real, but more so just some godlike engine that Thomas dreamed up one night. And her never appearing again after this simply doesn't contradict that. I think this is the best way to go about making sense of a magic engine in the series, and is definitely how I prefer to picture Lady. The whole Diesel vs. Steamy debacle is something that is touched on again a thousand times in the show, but this was its first really big conflict, and I really like how it was handled here. Neither side are depicted as obviously bad and the other good, like the Diesels aren't depicted as comically evil or anything. They're a little intimidating, sure. But no, the Diesels are just doing their jobs as they should be. Diesel just wants to get his goods delivered. Diesel 10 just wants to clear the scrap or whatever. Ari and Bert are kinda dickish at first, but eh, it's, it's nothing out of the ordinary. Gordon's a dick too most of the time, it's not exclusive to one side. It's Thomas who kicks off the whole conflict by his own cheekiness, and it domino effects into something much bigger. I love that they all, on their own, realize that they need to work together to achieve their goal. The opening of the airport affects both of them, and putting differences aside is the only way to achieve that ultimate goal. Predictable, sure, but it still has a nice message about acceptance and unity. You want to do a race war allegory thing in a kid's show like Thomas? Well, here's an example of how to do it well. Colonel Engines accomplished this pretty effectively, in my opinion. Some random observations on this rewatch. I found this shot of Diesel 10 funny. <laughs> you can tell Pinchy can't stretch any further and he can't grab anything, so he just dangles there awkwardly till the shot cuts. He's just dangling there. Menacingly! I also like that this piece of wood or whatever just 
falls and hits Diesel 10's face, and they just kept it in. There wasn't another take of this. Did they just keep this in because they thought it was funny? I mean, I think it's funny. I think this is the very first time we hear Gordon say his eventual catchphrase. The indignity, he huffed. The indignity, huffed Gordon. Twice, he says it. Oh, and also this. Next, Thomas and Percy had to go to the smelter's yard. Isn't that Rosie's theme? Rosie was a cheerful, chirpy little tank engine. Huh, it is. Hartshorn just reused some random existing theme for her later on. Interesting. In conclusion, I like Colonel Engines more than Season 8. I think there's a good story with a good moral muddled under all the padding. I like that there's an explanation for Emily's big addition to the main cast. But the learning segments ultimately ruin it, and draw it out, and make it boring, as well as some other bizarre decisions in its storytelling. I know it's Thomas the Tank Engine we're talking about here, a kid show, but still. It kind of feels like ultimately nothing happened here, besides Emily getting her birth. We know the steam diesel conflict just resets after this movie, and none of the big returnees appear again, so this isn't really a crucial watch. It's not like the worst special ever or anything, but it is pretty predictable, it's pretty forgettable, and it kind of just feels like a long episode. It is not one I really ever desire to rewatch. Though I could watch the sequence of the bridge collapsing on repeat all day. I highly recommend checking out Usual Bloke Luke's review of Colin All Engines, and he suggests a rewrite of the movie that is quite wonderful. Link is above and in the description. Alright, let's get into Season 9 now. So, right away, the continuity from Colonel Engines is weird and cherry-picked. Some stuff is retained, such as the suspension bridge being rebuilt and Emily being at Tidmouth Sheds. But, pretty much everything else is just kind of immediately forgotten. All the returning characters do not show up again. Daisy, George, Diesel 10, yeah, they're not in this season. And strangely, the airport doesn't appear? I was surprised by that. The big new location the movie is centered around and it's not in the connected season? What a strange choice. Also, the whole diesel steamy conflict resolution has just been forgotten because something 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 status quo. I have to say, watching the movie and then the season back to back makes scenes like this just so depressing. Working with diesels was fun after all, said Thomas. And working with steamies wasn't bad either, said Diesel. But we'd better be careful. I saw them at the yards with Harry and Bert. They were laughing together. James was shocked. A steamy friendly with diesels. No one learned their lesson. Not a single one of them. On the model side of things, I am happy to say that they seem to get rid of that weird GoPro looking camera for close-ups that they use so often in Season 8. There's a random few shots here and there where it is used, but for the most part, it's been ridden of. I'll be shocked if it shows up in Season 10. The model work is just as good as it always is, and there's not really much to talk about here regarding that. But something I am getting very, very tired of already are the generic mainline sets, which are usually just three straight tracks in a green countryside. Sometimes there's a bridge, or a signal, maybe a tunnel if we're lucky, but for the most part, they all look the same. I feel that this is all related to something I am starting to notice in the visuals. An aspect of the classic seasons I absolutely love is how each one was a development from the previous, each introducing a new technique that was pretty exclusive to it. Season 2 had its long panning shots. Season 3 used a lot of sets with working water. Season 5 used directly in front of the engine tracking shots, etc. Each season had its own distinct look and feel, dictated by the crew's visual developments over time. You can easily tell Season 2 from Season 1, Season 5 from 4, etc. Even Season 8 you can tell from Season 7 simply from the switch to digital cameras and the new direction style from Steve Asquith. I am feeling that these later seasons are starting to blend together visually. There's not much that's really distinctive from Seasons 8 and 9. There's the lack of the GoPro camera being used, I guess, and the color of the ballast? I don't know, it looks kind of more yellowy to me. Maybe that's just me. 
Season 8 and 9 look rather similar in my opinion. And oh boy, looking ahead, Season 10 looks almost exactly like 9. The model work is great, I don't fault it, but I feel like they've sort of peaked with visuals, as it doesn't really seem like they're really innovating anymore to improve the medium. Thomas is very much in a corporate era right now, where they seem to be more focused on just getting content out every year, and not really devoting time to improving the craft. That's at least the vibe I get from it. I wholeheartedly welcome the notion to feature the narrow gauge engines as consistent B characters in the series. The frequent use of these characters allows Sodor to feel vast and huge, because through them the audience gets to experience the mountainy areas of Sodor, and the mythos that comes from this part of the world. This is a nice breakup from the green countryside mainline sets that we usually see. I love the addition of Mr. Percival. Giving the narrow gauge characters their own authority figure really helps sell the idea that this part of the world is separate from the norm. I also really love the addition of Mythos with Proteus, this sort of legendary engine everyone in the hills knows of. It's nice that this wasn't like a one-time thing either, as Proteus becomes story relevant again in a later season. These are two excellent pieces of world building. In addition to the introduction of Mr. Percival, Dowager Hat also makes her grand return to the series this season, and Farmer McCool continues to make his seasonal appearance. There's even an episode that revolves around a hilariously pretentious artist. Hmm, too green. I want you to show me somewhere special. I can tell they're really trying to take advantage of their human cast a bit more now. I'm sure they figure that kids got bored seeing Sir Topham Hat be the only human that really appears all the time. With the narrow gauge engines now getting prominently featured, all the random returnees and colonel engines, more human characters, and even Bill and Ben popping up a couple times, Ben even appears once without Bill, which was certainly an interesting choice, I definitely see efforts here to expand the cast. And I'm happy about this. This is starting to feel more like Thomas as we knew it, where we get a break from the main characters to spend time with some of the lesser knowns. This season doesn't feel as empty as season eight did. How these characters are written, however, well, that's another discussion that we'll get to later. Oh, don't you worry. I'm also happy to say the pacing is notably snappier than it was in Season 8. The episodes all vary in quality, of course, but it never feels like things are dragging. They don't use needlessly long takes that often. The drawn-out opening montages are still a thing, but we have a couple episodes this year that jump right into the story, quickly after they start. And we even get some time fades to fall in action that occurs days later. Even in a completely forgettable run-of-the-mill Thomas Learns Not to Rush episode, things roll out at a steady pace. I think I can safely say that the dreaded Three Strikes formula that we all loathe reared its ugly head in this season. Though it wasn't used as much as I thought it was. It's only really prevalent in a couple episodes, like Percy and the Oil Painting. Percy shows the artist three main locations. The third one is the one that the artist hates the most, or the magic lamp. Peter Sam notices three lights in the fog. The third is the most strange. But even then, these stories don't feel that formulaic to me. It's a fine structure for storytelling, and I'm happy to see it's not being overused and abused yet. And lastly, let's talk narrators. Michael Angelus is our UK narrator again, of course, and he isn't anything worth screaming about this year. He's still talking slower in his usual hit era voice. I feel a bit more energy this time though. He doesn't sound as dead inside as he did in seasons seven and eight. Without fail, he has his little moments. I love this growl for Diesel 10 here. Diesel 10 growl loudly. And I love the totally pretentious voice that he gives the artist in Percy and the Oil Painting. The sand is too yellow, he sighed. I want you to show me somewhere special. And then there are times where I just feel like Angelus forgot the characters' voices. Like, in this episode, Henry shouts all his lines like he's deaf. Hello, Henry. You're very nice, Trevor, puffed Henry. But you wouldn't make a very good flagpole. That's a pretty funny line, but did you really need to shout that? And then he sounds like this in another episode. No, 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 slow and strong is always best, Susan Henry. As for Michael Brandon, well, 
I'll never get the dinosaur to the transfer yards now. I don't want Sir Topham Hatt to know, hissed Edward. I'm a really useful engine, not a really silly one. Thank you, whistled Neville. I'm the bravest engine in all the world, he called. Yeah. Brandon has had his moments as narrator. I loved his enthusiasm in the Jack episodes, and I actually thought he was quite decent in season 8. But we're a couple in now, and the annoying Brandon voices that we all hate are all here. I could cherry pick some moments throughout the season that I did enjoy with him, but my overall thoughts is that he was not the best pick as a narrator for Thomas. Season 9, not his best season. In third place this year is a tie between, well, several characters. Henry, James, Edward, Toby, Scarlowy, and Rusty, all with two main roles each. In second place with three main roles is Percy. And the first place prize goes to... Thomas. What a surprise. With a whopping 14 main roles. Yeah, I think you can all see why I wanted to opt out of doing this rankings thing for the hit era seasons. But hey, we gotta be consistent. Let's start off the characters section by talking about the narrow gauge engines, who are all a highlight and a detriment to this season. I call them a highlight because I welcome more secondary characters getting the spotlight, but they are a detriment because of how abysmally they are written. I have absolutely no doubt in my mind that the hit team greenlit bringing back the narrow gauge engines because they could market them as baby trains, with their gimmick being they're these tiny little mystical trains that Thomas interacts with, and that tracks with how they chose to depict these characters. Scarlowy and Reneas both took the brunt of this recharacterization, with both of them aging in reverse. Previously, Scarlowy and Reneas were the oldest engines on the island of Sodor, but now, since the narrow gauge engines are the baby trains of the show, they act like little children. This is something that they had already started getting wrong back in season 7, but now, it's just flat out what their characters are. In Reneas' spotlight episode, Reneas and Scarlowy get into like a playground fight about getting to pull a dinosaur skeleton. No, I'll show Mr. Percival I could do it on my own. In Scarlowy's episode, he infamously decided to go up the incline to show everyone how brave he was. They come off as children, and Michael Brandon's horrible voices for them don't exactly help either. Look at me! Look at me! He puffed. Rusty, in his episode, is portrayed as forgetful, and more invested in what he wants to do, rather than being responsible and level-headed, like he has been in every other episode prior to this. Peter Sam, for some reason, is now a Debbie Downer. He's the critical one of the group, putting down the legend of Proteus. The incline must be working by morning, so I won't be wasting my time looking for a silly magic lamp. This feels like something that Duncan should be saying, not Peter Sam. Peter Sam was always the optimistic one. What a small shed. This won't do at all. We're much too good for this old shack. I think it's nice, said Peter Sam. If anything, he should be the one of the group that is believing that the legend was real. And sadly, this whole episode hinges on him being a naysaying pessimist. The magic lamp I know isn't true. It's just an old story and quite silly too. Duncan's the only one that kind of gets away unscathed, but even then, I feel his personality isn't right. He's too... nice. In his Spotlight episode, Duncan is looking forward to taking some passengers on a trip to the caves. But an emergency changes plans last minute, and he gets assigned to haul dirty coal instead. Duncan was very disappointed. He wanted to go to the caves. The real Duncan we know wouldn't be sad about this. No, he'd be a grump, and complain about it endlessly, and probably go on and on about how he's being treated unfairly. I'm overworked, and I won't stand it. Duncan's own dumb carelessness getting him trapped in a mine is definitely something he would do though, which is why I think this is an episode people generally like. And to its credit, yeah, it's a fun little Duncan adventure story. There are a couple other glimmering moments. Rusty going on the search for the lost Duncan is in character, and Scarlowy being the one to tell the legend of Proteus to the others was pretty fitting. 
Overall though, I can't say I'm happy with the direction they're going with the narrow gauge engines. None of them feel like the same characters that they once were. As for the main characters, I am happy to say that this year, most of them were treated well. Emphasis on most. There are two that didn't have the best year. The first is Thomas. He's, well, just more of the same as he was in Season 8. He's depicted as an impulsive, naive character with much to learn in episodes where he's the focus. And then, like Clockwork, is depicted as the exact opposite and the voice of reason in episodes where he's not the focus. Sometimes the thing you want is somewhere you wouldn't think to look, Puff Thomas. Thomas wasn't so sure. Why don't you ask him? Puff Thomas helpfully. Thomas flip-flops so much throughout the hit era, and I have no idea what type of character that they see him as. It feels like a they want their cake and eat it too sort of situation, but you can't do both. Pick one or the other and stick with it. Or, better yet, use a different character in place of Thomas when you need a voice of reason. Like, I don't know, how about the other blue guy? You know Edward's whole thing is being wise, right? Oh, but if they did that, then they would potentially have an episode without Thomas in it. And that would never do, not in the hit era. This is in fact the first season where Thomas appears in every single episode. There are a few that he doesn't speak in, but he definitely appears in all of them. That being said, Thomas does have a few good appearances this year. I love that he joins Percy in teasing Gordon in respect for Gordon. Thomas and the Statue is a solid Thomas episode, I think, that he's perfectly in character in. Thomas's day off and Thomas's new trucks are also quite good Thomas stories, at least in my opinion. Can you guess who the other main is that I think was mistreated? I'll give you a second. Yep. Oh, you all know me so well. Yes, it's Edward. Edward is... You know, I don't even want to talk about Edward, because I feel like a broken record at this point. It's no secret that I hate how the hit era treated Edward, but his spotlight episode this season I think is worthy of some discussion. Once again, we have another episode that depicts Edward as a frail, pathetic old man. In this one, Edward starts wheezing and fears Sir Topham Hat will scrap him if he finds out. I'm not a really useful engine anymore. So top of hat will have to send me for scrap. Now right away, I see some similarities here with last season's Squeak, Rattle, and Roll, my favorite up from last year. And in that episode, Gordon isn't fearful of anything at first. Diesel is the one that floats the idea of scrapping to him, and only later, once he starts making a noise that he can't explain, does Gordon's mind start to wonder. There's a passage of time. It takes a while for him to get there, and we understand how he comes to that conclusion. It isn't just immediate. Even the other episodes that season that deal with that same concept have fair explanations. In Percy's big mistake, Percy only comes to that conclusion after mishearing Topham with his driver. Percy has been late too often this week. He must go to the scrapyards tomorrow. So Topham Heck wants to scrap me, guess Percy. Again, there's an explanation. And I find it acceptable that the younger, impressionable, somewhat irrational characters like these would believe such a thing. In Saving Edward, Edward just immediately jumps to that conclusion and tries to hide his issues. Not to mention, it's Edward we're talking about here. The engine with the most life experience. The character who should know that Topham would never scrap him. Hell, Edward's wheezed and clanked in the past and he didn't think twice about it. Edward was getting old. His bearings were worn, and he clanked as he puffed along. This feels so out of character, and it totally stings of the writers not having a clue what to do with him. I always get this impression the writers just write a single Edward episode every season because they have to, because he's a main character, and that they just default to that abysmal description of him from the writer's bible. The bio even mentions that he's scared of being scrapped. Where on earth did they get that from? I do like the friendship between Edward and Thomas in this episode, just because that's a friendship that they show pretty rarely, but yeah, they just can't seem to get Edward right. The other main characters, on a lighter note, I feel were treated rather well. Toby was a notable highlight this year, with two major appearances that really delighted me. First we have Emily Knows Best, 
In this one, Toby is instructing Percy on shunting trucks in a yard. And I love how they've returned to the Percy looks up to Toby friendship here. Something that was totally forgotten seasons ago. Lines like this. Percy was worried. Toby usually knew best. Really delight me because... Yeah, that's right, Toby does know best. Emily tries to be queen for the day and boss them around, to which Toby says... You have to be clever to be a queen. Emily retorts, and Toby just laughs at her. I always know what to do. Toby laughed. Toby is so perfectly in character here. The old geezer that just tells it like it is. Who wrote this episode? Mark Seal. Mark, you get Toby, man. Props to you. And then there's his spotlight episode this year, Toby Feels Left Out. This one had all the potential to be one of those Toby is down on himself because he thinks he isn't loved anymore, or thinks he can't do something because he's self-conscious types of episodes, but it isn't. I think I remembered this one wrong, because that's not what happens at all. A museum is being opened on Sodor, and Sir Topham shares the news with everyone, except Toby. After spending a night mulling over why, Toby comes to the conclusion that just maybe, he's going to be placed inside the museum. But instead of moping around and feeling bad for himself, he instead takes action. He strives to prove his worth, getting himself filthy in the process. Call me crazy, but this feels very Toby to me. Even in the face of adversity, in what he thinks could be his final hour, Toby still gives 110%. This was undoubtedly the most shocking episode of the season for me on this rewatch. I came out of this feeling pretty delighted by it. A rare gem, if you will. It's not an amazing episode or anything. I totally get why someone wouldn't really jive with this one. And Toby running away from Topham at the end was a little silly, sure. But I was happy to see a Toby spotlight story in the hit era, where he isn't just a wet blanket the entire time. I also find it really funny how there are two episodes this season that involve Toby destroying his cow catchers, his front ones, and then his rear ones. If I had a nickel for every time Toby broke his cow catchers, I'd have two nickels. Which isn't much, but it's strange that yeah, 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 you all know the meme. Never again, or before this. Only in season 9. Emily is still in her bossy Lucy era. Queens are in charge and tell everybody what to do. I'd like to be a queen. Henry is still in his tree hugger era. Henry looked up at the tall pine tree. He didn't want it to be made into a flagpole. Both of which I don't mind. I've said it before, but I like that they're pushing aspects of these characters' personalities that help them stand out from the rest of the cast. They do show Henry pulling the express for Gordon again this year. Again, retconning the wishing tree episode from last year. God, that episode was so stupid. Henry wished he would never have to pull passengers ever, ever again. I think we can all agree, fans and show crew alike, that we can just forget this episode exists. And Gordon and James, well, eh, I don't have much to talk about with them. These two are, for the most part, pretty consistent. And I love that the Thomas-James rivalry is still alive and well. We did get some new characters, all of which speak in one single episode, and then we basically forget they exist after. Mighty Mac is probably the most memorable of the bunch, being a double-ended engine with two faces. I'm Mighty. And I'm Mac. An inspired concept. And funnily enough, they previously came up with the concept of a double Fairly Engine character back in Season 6, but was cut. So that's pretty interesting that the idea resurfaced. Molly and Neville are pretty forgettable, if I'm honest. They are immaculate model props. Like, Neville is just straight up a Q1 class in Gage 1. He's perfect. But these are the biggest nothing burgers of characters ever. Molly is... shy. Hmm. And Neville literally says four words total. Hello! Hello! Thank you! Whistled Neville. Wow. Dennis, I thought, had some potential, being a lazy character that tricks others into doing his work for him. Mischievous characters like that are fun to write for, and they could have come up with some good stories and a possible redemption arc for him, if they bothered to have him show up more than once. But having any of these newbies be regulars was never the intention, because as the crew themselves have admitted, by this point, new characters only existed purely to sell toys. They show up in a single episode to serve their purpose, 
and then they see no point in using them ever again. A total shame, really, because any of them could be interesting if they gave them more of a chance. I had to spend some time thinking about who the MVP award should go to. It wasn't immediately clear to me, frankly, but I think I landed on someone that truly deserves it. And that character is... Percy. Percy was truly a standout this year, being the most in-character he'll probably ever be in these hit seasons. He does have a couple of those token dumb Percy moments. What's a museum? asked Percy. But the more cheeky, angsty side of him is fully showcased this year. He's the one that starts the teasing of Gordon in respect for Gordon. Rattler Gordon's keeping it all awake, Keep Percy. I love his loyalty to Toby. And we got two pretty awesome moments this season where Percy just explodes. Full anger. Everywhere on Sodor is special, and so are the people and the children and the engines. We are all special. I love seeing this side of him come out again. It reminds me of his earlier episodes where he wanted to get even with Harold or the big engines for mistreating him. It all aligns with what I said about Percy and his Sodor's Finest video. He's never malicious in intent, but if you mistreat him, or others he cares about, prepare yourself for a storm. Season 9 is a season with some very good episodes, and a lot of stinkers. This year's standout goes to, in my opinion, Respect for Gordon. Respect for Gordon is not only a solid Gordon episode, but also a great Steam Team episode. I made a whole video on this in the past, and what this episode does really well is present us a story where every character in it is in the wrong, and has a learning arc. In this one, Gordon's firebox makes noises when it cools down at night, something he's rather embarrassed about, and the other engines tease him about it. Rattler Gordon's keeping it all awake! Hey, Percy. Rattler Gordon's here. He's pulling the Click Clunk Express. It starts to annoy Gordon so much that he demands the others respect him whenever he's around. The engines don't take kindly to this, of course. You can choose it him if you like, but I'm not going to. Gordon's arrogance causes him to miss a signal, and he crashes. A particularly glorious crash sequence, I gotta say. One of the most brutal in this era. While he's away, Henry and Emily take over the Express. And after realizing how tiring Gordon's job is, the engines all start to realize that maybe Gordon does deserve the respect that he seeks. Maybe they were in the wrong to tease him. There's a wonderful scene at the end of the episode where all the characters have a heart to heart, each seeing each other's side of the issue. I realize now that engines toot toot other engines because they work hard and deserve it, not because they ask for it. But we think you do deserve it, Gordon. Everyone has an arc here, and it ends with a wonderful line from the narrator that feels straight out of the classic era. Now all the engines greet each other with a cheerful toot toot for all the hard work they do on the Fat Controller's Railway. This episode has a wonderful message about what it means to actually be a respected person about not putting down others for something that they can't help, and what it truly means to be a part of a team. It's a brilliantly written episode, not just for the hit era, but in general. I believe it deserves the pick for this season's standout, and it is also my favorite episode of the season, and of the entire hit era. Worst episode is a no-brainer. You all know what it's going to be. Scarlowy the Brave. This one sucks hard. Scarlowy is written as a child here, with this weird need for an ego boost. He just has to show everyone he's the bravest engine around. And to do that, he decides to go up the incline. I'm the bravest engine in all the world, he called. It's insanely idiotic. It's obviously very dangerous. And it occurring at all means the characters have to forget past events. Scar Louie saw what happened the last time an engine went up the incline. That is the bravest thing to do, chuffed Duncan. And why are you saying this, Duncan? How quickly you forget. This one's a real stinker, totally emblematic of the turn the narrow gauge engines took in this era. 
I don't think I like any of the characters in this one. I find them all pretty unlikable. Thomas and the New Engine is also up there for me as a real stinker. It's another where everyone is just so out of character, especially Edward. That new steamy Neville is best friends with the Diesels. He doesn't want to be with steamies at all. And it feels so wrong for the steam engines to be suspicious of Diesels coming right after calling all engines, where the entire point of the movie was for both sides to learn to get along and find strengths in each other. The new character doesn't do anything and barely says anything. Everything about this one is just so strange and not very well thought out. As for the sum up, I'm going to go with Thomas and the Toy Shop. It is a very unremarkable episode, a very forgettable episode, a very run-of-the-mill type of episode, and a very Thomas-focused episode. All descriptors I can also say about Season 9. At the same time, there is nothing really wrong with this one, and I don't think anyone is really out of character here. It's perfectly middle of the road, just like Season 9. Now, Respect for Gordon is also my pick for favorite episode of the season, but I also have another that I'd like to give some praise to. I really enjoyed Thomas and the Statue, and I'll place that as my number two. Thomas feels very in character in this one, getting a big head thinking this new mystery statue is of him. Percy, Percy, I think the statue is of me. Really, Thomas, you want Percy? That's nice. In fact, everyone feels in character in this one. The others all end up getting annoyed with this constant boasting. Even Edward gets annoyed with him, and Percy even calls him out for it in one of his explosive moments. Please stop talking about the statue. No one wants to hear about it anymore. No one wants to talk to you anymore. And neither do I. Thomas makes it all up to them when he goes out of his way to plow the lines for everyone when it starts snowing. And that means something, since it's common knowledge that Thomas hates his snowplow. The reveal that the statue is of all the engines is nice, and the grand panning out shot showing everyone together with Topham at the podium feels very finale-esque. I'm kind of shocked this wasn't the season finale, to be honest. I also quite enjoyed Mighty Mac, purely because it is a story about a new character that is solely focused on the new character. A trend I notice in these new character episodes is that they aren't the main character of their own story. Usually it's a main character episode, like Thomas, and they meet a new face in it. Mighty Mac, however, is entirely about Mighty Mac, showing what a day in the life of an engine with two personalities is like. Just as one would expect, trouble ensues, and the pair have to find common ground to get themselves out of the mess they got themselves in. Mighty Mac is probably the new character this season that is the most memorable, and I have no doubt the fact that they got a story all to themselves that allowed their personalities to blossom is why. Also them being an engine with two faces probably helped. The word I would use to describe Season 9 is, well, it's more of a phrase than a word, peaks and valleys. In a lot of ways, Season 9 and Colonel Engines feel like a significant improvement over Season 8. More secondary characters are being featured, most of the mains felt more consistent this time around, for the most part, the pacing is snappier, and there's a nice return to world building with a slew of new locations and new welcome permanent additions such as Mr. Percival and The Legend of Proteus. The good episodes this year are notably good, with my favorite episode of the whole hit era being from this season. But the things they get wrong on the writing side are almost unforgivable. Many characters don't feel anything like the ones we knew only a few seasons ago, the narrow gauge engines in particular. The new characters are mostly nothing, they are there just to sell toys. And visually I think everything is starting to stagnate, with little innovation happening on the filming side of things. Thomas is more of a machine now, no pun intended, designed to just churn out new content every year. And as a result, the quality of it varies. It makes me miss the days when there was a nice gap of time between new seasons, which allowed the crew time to improve their craft, make sure every story brought something interesting to the table, and just be creative. Season 9 is a very middle-of-the-road season. It's not totally bad, per se, 
and that alone just might make it the best of the hit era. I can say, with total certainty, that I enjoyed my time with this more than I did with Season 8. How it will rank with everything else will be very interesting. Starting with this video, I'm going to start doing something at the end of videos. It's a little segment I like to call Tug's Pick of the Week. Basically, this is just a moment where I shout out a video from a fellow creator that I want to put on people's radars. The video I choose to highlight here could be anything really. Something really cool from a fellow fandom member, or something that's semi-related to the topic of the video. Or maybe a video that was just super helpful in helping me write the script. Or maybe it's an older video that was really interesting to me, and I just wanted to share it. It could be anything. Basically, I just want to spend this time showing some love to my fellow creators. For this week's pick, I'd like to shout out Caleb Train's absolutely amazing Down the Mine adaptation. It is a complete retelling of the original story, complete with voice actors and all the visuals created by him. Caleb continues to top himself when it comes to visuals. He's really pushing the limits of what can be done with tiny 00 scale models on camera. The sets in this are zero to none, and I am so impressed with how he captured the mind collapse sequence. It's better than how they did it in the actual show, if I'm honest. Link to this is above and in the description. Go show this man some love. And that's all from me, folks. I hope you enjoyed this retrospective, and I'll see you all back here when we cover Season 10. Have a great day, y'all. See ya.